Cool. So, Karen Gibb, welcome to The Disenfranchised. How are you doing today? Hi, Ed. Thanks so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, the sun is shining in Scotland, so I am great today. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you very much. And um, like we said last time we spoke, it's always sunny up there. I don't know what uh, <laughs> everyone up north is, is is going on about, that it's uh, horrible weather and things like this. I, I went up to I Manchester swear. the other day and it was sunny again. It's uh... I swear the two, the two days that I've spoke to you, it's been sunny, but not in between. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just a hidden secret, maybe. Are you trying to keep away from us southerners? <laughs> absolutely absolutely we, we want we want less population so we can enjoy the sun in peace <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good plan anyway Karen let's um let's crack on with the interview and um like I do with all my guests it'd be great to find out what was your first job really funny I was listening to a couple of your podcast episodes and I realized I was always desperate for a job like from a really young age so when I was 12 my mum said that I could go and clean the neighbor's house it was an elderly couple so I went along and I did two hours on a Tuesday, three pounds an hour I got. And uh, I don't think I was the greatest cleaner, um, but I was determined to earn my own money and be independent. And then actually after that, my mum decided to start giving me my ch- the child benefit, like the allowance, to start giving me that directly so I could buy my own clothes and, and, and be totally sufficient <laughs> as a very, very young adult. I don't think that part actually lasted that long because I think I got the money and then just spent it in the first week <laughs> and then had nothing left. Um, but from an early age, I can definitely see that entrepreneurial kind of spirit at least. I then yeah, sure. went on to wash dishes in the local restaurants. Um, when I was 14, I lied and said I was 15 so I could get the job because I was so desperate to to move up and, and earn more money. I have to say I haven't kept that character of, of telling lies since then because I remember when it was my birthday and I was turning 15, I was so worried they were going to find out that I'd actually lied. So it was a... <laughs> It was a good experience on how maybe not to move things forward as a business person. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I think that sounds pretty typical for a lot of people really is doing kind of odd jobs and bits and pieces and working in somewhere fairly local at at the sort of ground level, really, I guess. But um, did you then go into university after education, you know, the high school education or did you um, did you go into the work world? So I, I became, I really wanted to be a teacher. I thought that would be my, my, my dream. So up here, it's called modern studies. Down south, probably the closest subject would be modern politics is the, is the best way to describe it. Okay. So I thought, right, I'm going to be this high school teacher. I wrote it in my, my yearbook at the end of high school and I was so determined. And I only scraped into university through the clearing process. Um, I didn't actually get the grades the first time round. I wasn't very academic. I was a lazy student. And when I say lazy, I mean that I was very... I always wanted to find a really efficient way to do things. And for me, studying was not an efficient use of my time. In, in, in my head, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so I scraped into university. And my first year at uni, I went off to America. And I actually... <laughs> wash dishes there like some it's a bit like camp america so you go away and you, and you work in the kitchen there so i had the best time actually doing that and i still have friends 15 years later from then but it kind of shows that pattern of work that i had did end up leading me into, into bigger things so i became a teacher and i did it for one year and then i went away and um, traveling for four years in my early 20s so I lived in Canada and Australia and I did loads of odd jobs. So I was picking rosemary. I worked in a nursery with children. I just had all these weird and wacky jobs. But actually, when I came back to the UK in 2016, I realised when I went back into teaching that it perhaps wasn't the right path for me. And actually, that I was fiercely independent and I didn't really like people telling me what to do, if I'm completely honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. I can see that. But uh, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I, d- I just want to find out what it was about teaching that you thought this is this is the, the career I want to go into. I came from a family of teachers and social workers. There was always that natural help. My brother's a lecturer as well. So there was always that natural help and and willingness to help other people and and especially young people. My mother also had a children's nursery as well. So we were very, very, um, it, it it was just such a natural progression for me. 
and and I did enjoy it I did enjoy working with the young people but very very quickly like most teachers I got swamped in the admin the meetings the, all the extracurricular stuff that you are expected to do as a teacher and perhaps with very little meaning behind things I would often question and say is this going to benefit the children you know I'll do it if it benefits the children but if it's just another administration task is it needed and, you know, when, when you're in school and, and other teachers are there, you know, perhaps that's not appreciated or perhaps you all need to stick together to, to get that work-life balance better. Um, but that wasn't always the case. So yeah. I really thought I would be a teacher my whole life. I thought that was the career path and I did enjoy it, but very quickly realised that actually I, I need to try something else. But I just wasn't quite sure what that was at that stage. Sure. And it, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people's perception of a teacher is, you know, finish at quarter past three and then you have loads of these holidays and things like that. But as I'm discovering at the moment, my wife is a, a, a teacher or teacher to be. And um, there's a lot of hours, actually, a lot of, you know, outside of what people class to be a typical nine to five into the evenings, uh, lesson planning and stuff like this. And then even into the weekend sometime as well. So um, I can see that you know it's perhaps not what what people expect from the outside but also I think it's interesting for for you that that's quite a business mindset to try and find efficiencies all the time um I, I've noticed from kind of any government body of, of any type really you know there's not that kind of efficiency process in you know looking at those efficiencies and processes in place it's more um kind of what do I have to do and I'll do that kind of thing isn't it so yeah, it sounds like you didn't fit in, but um, <laughs> interesting you went to America and started picking rosemary. That's quite a strange <laughs> thing to be doing. <laughs> you know, and it's funny because at the time you don't realise that you're doing all these little odd jobs or you're, but you're actually building this resilience. And so it, it was it was Australia that I, that I picked the, the rosemary in and it was um, just outside Melbourne and it was freezing cold. You know, you had this perception that Australia is always roasting hot and this was their winter. So we would be standing in these fields of rosemary. I mean, I didn't even know how rosemary was produced. <laughs> we'd be standing in these fields and fields of rosemary literally just picking it off and uh, ha have our earphones in just picking rosemary and it would be like torrential rain and there'd be howling gales you just have your hood up and it, do you know it really did build your resilience I mean it was pretty horrendous at times and I won't lie I did get let go after about two months but that was that was enough for me anyway by that point so <laughs> I was yeah. quite happy to move on but at the time you don't appreciate what all this is building in you and or or shaping you to be a, a person a bit different later on in life yeah yeah definitely it's sort of hard work and like you say being resilient are really good skills to have once you then move into more of the the the, the business world so to speak so um yeah yeah. So so yeah, what, what then happened after um all of this travelling and um realizing that teaching wasn't for you? What what kind of what, where did you get to in your life? I was really, really interested in mental health and I'd been I had suffered anxiety, as most people do, um, throughout my life. So I'm I'm a very confident person on the outside, but I do have that like like many people, that imposter syndrome, that the doubts and the, the, the things that creep up inside our heads, you know, that I can't do things or I'd always had this feeling in the pit of my stomach and I didn't realise it was anxiety. I thought anxiety had to be sort of, you know, you had to go to the doctor and be diagnosed. And I went along in about, this was about 2017, I went along to an NHS stress control class and it was all about managing emotions, mindfulness, and really how to how to work with with your with yourself to, to be the best version of yourself. And it was like a light bulb moment for me because I'd never realised I was in control of situations. Like I'd never realised that I couldn't control other people, but that I could control maybe my own behaviour. And for me, that was just a huge like the penny dropped because for so long I'd tried so hard to to fit in or to to make people you know like me and I realized really quickly that actually all I can do is be myself and display my own behavior and other people you know they, they have to work on themselves so that was a huge learning curve I then and, and sorry just I, just to stop you there for a second um so what made you go along to that that course because you're right a lot of people do have those feelings and they kind of just push it to one side and sort of plow on don't they and um 
and it, it sort of hangs around. So uh, why why sort of say, right, actually, I'm going to attend one of these classes? Because I guess they, uh, there has been a bit of a stigma attached to it all, you know, where people feel, you know, if I go there and my friends find out or family find out, they're going to think I'm strange or, or weird or something like this. So <laughs> it's quite brave to do well, that. It's true. It's true. I had a really um, difficult relationship with a head teacher at that point where I had felt um, really intimidated by them and their behaviour and I'd felt really anxious about my own teaching and, and started to doubt myself as a teacher. And I'd seen this advert for this stress control class. I'd said to a friend, oh, we should just go along kind of half-heartedly. But it was a six-week block of lectures. So you weren't you weren't speaking in it. You were just listening. Um, and I was quite interested in, in, in that kind of the mental health side of things. So we did go along together. And we both were, like, really taken aback. Because back then, mindfulness, is, of course, has been around. But it's not as commonly known as it is today. Yeah. And I hadn't really... I thought mindfulness was some sort of, like, meditation. Or I, I wasn't really sure what it was. So we went along and that's that's when I sort of realised, whoa, this is very cool and I don't know anyone that's really teaching this in schools. So I'd love to say there was a great plan from then on, but as with most things in my life, um, <laughs> you go back into that classroom and you think, right, I'll just give things another chance, but it, it just didn't work for me. I was, uh, what do they say, a square peg in a round hole? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was me. So I thought... I'll try a few things in the class. So I started working a little bit on, I did another mindfulness course in the background. So I was kind of always learning from this stage onwards, yeah. taking things into my own hands and learning about kind of well-being for myself, but but for young people as well. So I did a couple more courses, twilight sessions about mindfulness and well-being. And then I went back into the class and kind of ran these little taster sessions with my guinea pigs. Um, so the pupils were delighted, you know, they were just like, <laughs> whatever like whatever what's she doing today type thing but I guess they didn't know what they were doing right no no and it wasn't like I was doing anything harmful I was just trying to see if they could manage their own emotions in their own way and I started to realize that things I developed this program that was really working um and that's when I thought how can I what what can I do with this next so I'd love to say, yes, there was a business idea and yes, I knew what I was going to do, but I didn't. And I think that's been the case my whole life. But I'm actually OK with that now. Um, I think that's maybe just how I'm, I'm designed to, to be, if you like. Yeah. So then I developed the lessons and the lesson plans and I did taster sessions in other schools. So just free taster sessions to see how it would all work. And, you know, trial and error, get things right, get things completely wrong. Um, <laughs> but just, just keep learning. <laughs> and eventually, eventually, in 2018, Mind Marvels was born. So that's my business now. Yeah, fantastic. So um, at, at what point then did you leave teaching and, and take on this business full time? So the good thing and the not so good thing about teaching is you've always got that in the background. So I resigned from my post and then I went on supply teaching. So I thought okay. I'll do this while I do supply teaching. So then um, I was doing supply teaching maybe three, four days a week, working one day in a different school doing mind marbles. So just building up really, really, really slowly. Um, it did take time, Ed, a lot of time actually. Because um, the naivety as well as you think, oh, I'm a teacher, I know what I'm doing, but actually you need to prove yourself to other people. It's not just a case of you going in and being like, hi, I'm here. <laughs> um, so it did take a little bit of time. And then what happened, well, we know what happened <laughs> with the pandemic. So everything was going really well. I was about to drop all supply days and then obviously that happened. And that then pivoted me a little bit because I went online with some stuff. Um, but really what happened was I had to go back into schools on supply and work in the hubs during during COVID. So it did kind of set me back a little bit. And this is when I was really starting to think about the business and thinking when things come out, we're going to be busy. You know, this, this is so important what I do. So what Mind Marvels is, is calming strategies and practical tools to support mental wellbeing. So we base it on the NHS five steps to mental well-being. So it's learn, move, connect, mindful, and be kind. 
So every session, short, sharp bursts of sort of ways to feel calm and the little strategies that young people can take away. So I knew this was going to be busy after the pandemic, but I just didn't know what to do with it. And I'd thought about taking on staff, but I just wasn't sure if that was what I wanted to do. Did I want to be a manager? I wasn't sure if that was that was where I wanted the business to head. And that's where I thought, what about franchising? And I was yeah. really sceptical. <laughs> I've heard lots of cynical things about, about franchising and I think people confuse it with pyramid schemes and MLM companies. Yeah, and, of course. Yeah, and I don't know if you came across that before, Ed, where there's quite a ne- bit of negativity around franchising. Yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's the, probably the biggest challenge the, the industry as a whole has, really, is the, the outside perception of it. So, yeah, people think it's either McDonald's and it's unobtainable because it's so expensive, or the, <laughs> the opportunities are, yeah... Um, dodgy maybe because there are LMM, MLMs out there that are calling themselves a franchise and and really they're not um, partly because it's it is unregulated in the UK so um, you know I think there are there are challenges for businesses that are doing it well to kind of overcome those those negative perceptions but uh, as I've discovered speaking to so many franchisors founders of businesses you know um, there's way more out there that actually have the right ethics in place and are genuinely wanting to make an impact on 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 the world and um, have a reason why so uh, it's clear what your why is you know to have an impact on on young children but um, I'm wondering if you've seen something in children like what what the kind of typical um, symptoms or, or or telltale signs that a child is maybe struggling and 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 the, yeah, explain in a little bit more detail your kind of um, day to day sessions and how that's helping those children to overcome those those challenges. Yep, maybe. Yep. So I think a lot of the symptoms is very similar to adults. So how we experience anxiety or um, stress. So they might have they might complain of like sore stomachs. So you know parents might naturally think they're ill or there's something you know really seriously wrong with them when it could be that they are feeling just those those kind of anxious feelings uh headaches clammy hands clammy feet um unable to move or walking or talking lots um which now that i think about myself as a child i used to just be 100 miles per hour all the time like go 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 so that kind of nervous energy as well um but it can go exactly the other way, where they can be really quiet, withdrawn, um, moody, if you like, um, for for what of a better expression there. Um, <laughs> but I think so much of this is we take it as children and it becomes part of our life as adults as well. And that's what I was really keen to sort of try and prevent. I know that we'll always have these feelings. They don't just go away, but it's having the strategies from a young age to deal with it now and for life. So with our sessions, we work in nurseries and primary schools mostly, and it's really about building up children's resilience <clears throat> right up to um, up to the end of primary school. And that's purely because even though I was secondary trained, I just found it was easier to work with young people and tr- like younger children and try and embed this um, rather than get to, to teenage teenagers um as you know we have a lot of resistance when we get to that age with peer pressure yeah. so. <laughs> they want to um, go out and earn money don't they <laughs> <laughs> if they're anything like me yes <laughs> <laughs> but um it just seems to work really well because the sessions can be 30 minutes to 45 minutes long and they, they learn about the brain and their body and what's going on because because for a lot of us we don't actually know what's happening when the body's feeling like this or the brain is reacting a certain way and then we learn about our emotions and we, we do a little bit of mindful movement which is just some nice stretching and then we we do a little bit of, of our breathing strategies as well and then we move on to we've got mindful massage as well so they will either um, massage their own arms or hands or it will be peer to peer so child to child on their back fully clothed and what's really good about mindful massage is they always ask permission. So it's all about consent as well, which in this day and age is really, really important because we know that young people are seeing a lot more online at a very early age than perhaps what, what we would ever, ever experience um, 
as children ourselves. So that's all about if children want to take part in that, you know, positive touch is really, really important. But if, again, a child is not interested, that's absolutely fine. It's all about that permission. And that's so yeah. important as well, because we don't always think about that, especially as adults. You know, we can be like, oh, come here, give me a hug, you know, to a child. And we don't always ask. And sometimes that's really important to ask. Yeah, it's good. It sounds like you're giving them the the right building blocks for, for, for life skills and you know in the long term which is really good and it makes sense I think that it's at that younger age rather than trying to start it in their in their secondary school ages yeah if you can get there yeah. early it makes sense yeah um, th- th- there's a couple of other things I was uh, wanting to ask you about this as well so uh, my kids have only just got tablets and I know a lot of kids at their school um, before they're six so my son's six now and he's just got a tablet but a lot of kids have had them since three four five so as that then turns into social media later on in life, um, do you think that's that's playing a big part in their their lives and how they feel about themselves? I mean, even at that young early age, and um, yeah, do these these sessions kind of help them to to deal with that, those challenges? Because it's a worry for a lot of parents, I think, me, me really in particular, is. anyway. Yeah, it really is, Ed. And I think if we think about how we feel about our phones and our own devices and what we're accessing, how that affects our mood it's so relatable to how young people are feeling and I think when they're younger as well if they're maybe having bullying at school that can then lead on going home you know when we were young it was like you just went home and that was it but now you know they can be contacted outside the school so there is that big worry but it is like you said it's about those strategies to help deal with that or to have those open you know lines of communication between parents and children and, and, and vice versa as well so the strategies all tend to help young people with finding something to help them with their own resilience or their own sort of dealing with these big issues because when we feel angry we might want to scream and shout and it might feel good temporarily but does that really help us long term can we go into a workplace and scream and shout when we're older <laughs> Some people do. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. You're right. Some people do. But it's about what strategy can work for you, which one can work for you to help you long term. And that's that's the main takeaway from our sessions, which is really lovely. And the last little element of our session is a relaxation. So they all get to lie down at the end and they absolutely love that because how often do we do that with young people just to have a chill out you know um not at school anyway we're so busy aren't we all the time <laughs> yeah it's quite full-on isn't it school day for them yeah you know, it's if I think long. about how, how how difficult I find it to to focus and learn something over the course of a day you know it's, it's quite full-on isn't it so uh, absolutely it is, yeah. it is especially if they've been used to being at home you know during covid and then they've had to go into these all these strange faces looking at them afterwards you know it's it can be pretty overwhelming if mum and dad have been the main part of your life for so long and then you're you know transported into school what's going on there yeah sure so um for for the young kids I'm I'm guessing they're probably not as embarrassed as par- you know the adults as well um, to do the, some of these things because like I said earlier it, for me I would feel maybe uh, there's an element of embarrassment to go into something like that or it has been over the, the years perhaps not so much recently but um, for kids I'm guessing it doesn't matter mm-hmm. to them really you know well, they, they throw themselves into it or, or is there still signs yeah. of embarrassment? Oh, absolutely. There's still signs. And what you'll see usually in the first couple of weeks, children are really resistant. They just want to know what's going on. So they're like, who's a strange lady that's come into their school, you know, that's then doing these breathing exercises. So what they might do, some of them, is they might just sit and watch the first week. And I'm very like, that's absolutely fine to do that. Because again, I would never want to force young people. If you force young people to do something, they're they're not going to enjoy it. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, So I let them watch and then they, then they can come participate and that's fine with me. But what we do, we have parent and child classes in the community as well. So parents can come along with their children. And that's great because if you see your mum and dad doing the breathing exercises or you know the mind the mindful movements as well then all of a sudden it's not a big deal because mum and dad are doing it so you're modeling that good behavior for your child as well which is which is great cool that's good so look looking at uh, mind marvels as a business then for you so um is this full-time work is this something that you do part-time um yeah 
so just now I work um two to four days a week in schools um and I generally have a day of doing admin and and, and kind of working behind the scenes if you like there's always as you'll know Ed there's always things to do in the background we just don't <laughs> always get around can't get it. away from the admin can you <laughs> I know I know it's there it's there but yeah so it is it is very um very hands-on um but that's that's what makes it so enjoyable because you want to be in the schools you want to see the young people you want to be out in the community running the classes because that's where the enjoyment is when you see the difference that you're making to young people that that's huge for me yeah okay so that that, that's good so that's um pretty much full-time operation then that you're you're working Mm -hmm. on um and what's the kind of um the options to to generate revenue is it from the schools it you have to go to the governments uh these parent classes that you mentioned in the the evenings and weekends you know mm-hmm. is that something that you need to advertise i'm just trying to understand you know what kind of the business is going to look like for someone if they were to to look yeah. at your business as a franchise opportunity mm-hmm. So just now what we do is we offer parent and child classes in the community and any time I've ran them, they've been sold out because as far as I can see, there's not much out there that does what we do with the managing emotions. Yeah. And, and and parents are just as keen to, to learn as well, um, especially when you get to a certain age and you're like, I'm so stressed all the time, what can I do? <laughs> you know, so it, it's just as important for the parent as it is for the child. So we run the parent and child classes in the community and then we run nursery and school sessions. So that's the kind of three, the three big ones. And with the nursery, you've also got the option to run, you could run, you know, council and private, the same with the schools as well. Um, but what's really nice about that is it just means you're always surrounded by adults as well that are learning too. So you know, you're going to schools, the teachers are there, they're then learning the processes as well, because everything that I teach is just as appropriate for an adult to do as it is for a child, because it's all helping in the end. So they can then model that behaviour to the young people. So that's that's where we are just now. I, I have thought about moving into high schools eventually, um, but for now I'm focusing on primary schools, nurseries and parent and child classes in the community. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, you, you're a bit of a pioneer then really in this this uh, <laughs> this business because there's not too many people out there. So it must be quite difficult to, because uh, you've got no models to copy, right? You, you're literally one of the only people that are doing this. So you've got to kind of um, create these processes yourselves, create the lessons yourself. There's no kind of, they've done it that way. I like it, but I'm going to tweak it for my own style. This is all, you're creating yeah. it from scratch. So What's been some of the biggest challenges for you in in, in setting this up? Really, really good point. Yeah, I, I'd spoken to my franchise consultant and I said to him, you know, nobody else, I, I can't find anything to exactly what I like what I'm doing out there. And he said, Karen, someone always has to be first. So that always sticks with me because I think whenever, whenever I have those moments where I'm like, maybe there's a reason that no one else is doing this. But actually, it's because, you know, someone always has to be first. And I'm not saying I'm first in the world or there's nothing else like this. But from a franchising point of view, I do think it's quite a unique model. Um, It's not very saturated at all, that the particular kind of well-being that we are targeting, which makes it really, really exciting but of course, the challenges are always there. So when you have those days that don't go well, and let's be honest, children can be the most unpredictable people <laughs> in the world. <laughs> of course. But sometimes you go in and a lesson doesn't go to plan. Um, I had a lesson before Easter. All the children had like chocolate eggs. I went in and everyone's, you know, full of sugar and, um, you know, perhaps a little bit um, full of life, shall we say. And it was really difficult. It was a difficult lesson. And sometimes in those moments you go away and think, oh my goodness, you know, am I not good at this? Or, but actually it's all learning for me. There's always, there'll always be things that throw us off. And some people might go, right, I, I can't do this. I give up. But for me, it's just about how do you continually learn from that? So what I always say to people is things don't always go to plan and that's okay. It's just what our learnings can be from those situations that, that help us to go forward. Yeah, um, that's cool. Yeah. So yeah. I, 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 I use the term pioneer there because um, that's what I think a lot of franchise or franchisors are, you know, like a, a pioneer going up um, a, a new mountain that nobody else has ever climbed before, but they create this path for other people to follow. So um, 
<laughs> yeah, it might, it might be sort of a little bit winding and, and things like this, but, you know, you've got to find the, the route that works for you so you can show others. But, um, yeah, I can, I can imagine there's there's been a lot of challenges along the way and um, some tweaks that you've needed to make in, in what you thought was going to be the ideal situation, but didn't turn out to be that way. But at least now you've you've got that path and others can can know what tools they need and and what learnings they need to do before they they head into it so so that's pretty mm-hmm. cool um so i think i've um i'd like to move on to kind of my some of my sort of standard questions now that i ask everybody sure. so i'm i'm keen to find out what funny strange or weird stories you've got from your career so far from your work in life and it doesn't have to be about anything in the franchise and world or mind marvels it could be anything you're happy to share Oh, I've got so many. Like, I mean, you need to look at me, Ed, to know that. Um, yeah, I'm I'm a character myself, so uh, <laughs> so many <laughs> funny stories. Um, actually, the two that do bring to mind are from my Marvels, but just by coincidence. So last summer, I ran a taster session in a private school, and it was quite a posh kind of boarding school. So you know, you go and you're really eager to impress right so you walk up and you've got you know you've you've even ironed your uniform you know you're you're there already and um because of the covid measures they said we'll just do it outside it was a lovely sunny day another sunny day ed in scotland (laughs) (laughs) see i told you (laughs) Um, i know i know so we're all outside and it's it's the really small children so they're like four to five years old and we're sitting outside and I'm showing them the meerkat, which is like the breathing strap. So that that's like the, the fight, flight or freeze response inside your brain. So I'm showing them the meerkat. And then all of a sudden there's a big noise behind me. And there's two, there's a bird pecking a bird's nest in a tree and has brought the bird, the nest down onto the ground and is attacking the chicks, right? <laughs> I have never seen anything like this. So cool. We were about 10 metres away. And meanwhile, the, I, I, I'm not too good with bird names, right? But the mother bird has swooped down and is trying to fight this this other bird and protect her chicks. Meanwhile, this, this big bird swoops down, grabs the chicks, like literally the eggs and just flies off. But with this, there's all this commotion, there's squawking, there's obviously the mother <laughs> bird is like distraught. Not too relaxing, and is it? <laughs> oh, and I'm like, oh my goodness, could this possibly... <laughs> Meanwhile, I look around all the children and they're all just staring at it, like just like totally like mesmerised, but in horror mesmerised. Yeah, yeah. Like, pretty traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> could so you be with that to help them calm down though, right? <laughs> So I'm like, so then what happens is I spring into action, which is what you need to do in all these situations, and go, right, guys, well, what you've seen there is part and parcel of life and the life cycle. But when these stressful situations happen, here are some strategies we can use. <laughs> oh, fantastic. That's smooth. Tying it in so nicely. <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was pretty embarrassing. Um, and needless to say, I didn't get invited back to that school. I wonder if maybe that had traumatised everyone because the staff were pretty um horrified by by that i mean you just couldn't write that stuff you couldn't no. wake up that day and think that might happen today <laughs> can't um, plan for that one can you <laughs> i know i know and then the other funny story i have is i've got these little emoji stars with different faces facial expressions on them so i'm in this classroom and the head teacher's popped her head round. so obviously at that point you feel a bit more on edge you're like right you know i need to really this has to go really well so I'm showing that the, the children are about six years old. I'm showing them all the, the emoji stars and asking them what the facial expressions are. One little boy puts his fa- his, his hand up and the, the little face was like a confused face. And he says, Karen, that's a, that person is constipated. And I'm like, <laughs> right, well, yeah, perhaps they are. But, you know, that's not really the word that I'm thinking of. <laughs> God. Meanwhile, the head teacher is just like absolutely, you know, burst burst into laughter and <laughs> in her hands. And I thought, this is why I do this job because yeah. it's sometimes so unpredictable, but it brings so much laughter and and so much hilarity, you know. And I think the little boy probably meant confused, but he got he got the words a little bit mixed up. But maybe that's what he did mean as well. You just that's that's the beauty of mind marvels is that it's all interpreted by young people and adults in completely different ways but that kind yeah. of makes it a little bit magical as well because you never quite know what's going to happen in every session 
<laughs> I love it. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's 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 working with kids, isn't it? It's always something crazy that's just around the corner that you can't you can't predict. Uh-huh. So that's yeah, that's cool. Yeah. But um, mm-hmm. you you mentioned about the 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 birds there. Um, and that reminded me of a question I should have asked uh, sooner. You've got uh, yeah. an animal mind that you've described in the past. Of I saw when I was doing a bit of research, and I wondered if you could kind of talk through that a little, a little bit for me. Absolutely. So <clears throat> the way that I do it is, I say there's three animals inside the brain. So you've got your meerkat, which is your amygdala. You've got your owl which is your prefrontal cortex and then you've got your elephant which is your hippocampus and basically what happens is the meerkat likes to jump up and down when it thinks there's danger so that's when we might feel overwhelm or we might feel a bit scared or something's happened that's maybe dangerous but usually it's not really dangerous so it might be things like we've got a test at school coming up or we're going to a new person's house that's a friend so we feel a bit nervous about going somewhere new so what happens is the meerkat likes to jump up and down to alert us to the danger and then the owl which likes to keep us safe flies away so when the owl flies away the the meerkat basically we have to calm the meerkat so that the owl will come back because when the owl comes back our rational thinking comes back as well so and meanwhile the elephant is the library so the, it's the library of all our memories so it stores everything that we think about so that's why when we sometimes get at that feeling the meerkat jumping we remember that feeling every time so it's how we break that cycle when things aren't dangerous and that's by bringing in the breathing the calming strategies to help all the animals work together really nicely in the brain <laughs> yeah that's really that's cool it, it's <laughs> I guess it's um, so. I've heard this quite a lot with with my kids and what people say you're supposed to do, and you're reading books and things like this. It's labeling your emotions and putting a word to them is is good in some way, in many ways. But actually, what you're doing is kind of visualizing it for them. Because I, I, as you were describing it, I was imagining you know the meerkats popping up and and then the <laughs> owl being scared by that and, and flying away. So it makes a lot of sense to do it in that way. And it's yeah, it's a really smart smart way to do it. So. Uh, you know- I've had like children aged three in nursery, you know, saying, Karen, I feel my meerkat jumping. And I think, wow, that's so, I mean, they might not totally understand the ins and outs of everything, but if they can feel that weird feeling in their stomach or that way where they feel like, you know, their hands are getting a little bit wetter, it's just like they're starting to realise when their meerkat is jumping that they, they have solutions and ways to ways to support themselves with that, which is just, it blows my mind really, because I just wish this has been around so much when I was younger. I really do. Yeah. It, it helps the parents as well, I guess, to understand it because uh, they can they can use a word, but if they keep on using that word in different scenarios, it, it, yeah, it doesn't really help. But um, mm. using meerkat, that's a completely different word to any other vocabulary they may have, which can then help you to identify what's, what's going on and trigger for the parents, okay, well, let's do this now because because of the tools perhaps you taught them in one of the sessions so yeah, that's yeah, cool I, so mm-hmm. I, I was going to say um so just moving on to my my next question then and that was um what's been the proudest moment in your career so far or the most inspiring oh <laughs> um proudest moment uh, uh, cliche but there's so many you know I think just those little moments when you get the feedback from children it doesn't need to be anything big but just that light bulb moment that I had age 27 that they had when they were like five years old so just seeing that impact of helping young people I do an anonymous poll at the end of all the sessions where they hold up a QR code and it scans what in relation to the answer they've chosen so it is all pretty anonymous and getting the results back it just just blows my mind every time because I think wow we really are helping young people and I'm not naive about it. I don't think it's done, it happens straight away. I think it's something that's really hard to measure because how many times can you measure when someone just takes a deep breath instead of saying something straight off the bat to someone else, you know? But it's it's finding one solution. So with, with young people, I always try and explore. They, they can find one breathing strategy or one calming strategy 
then then they just keep that for life. They don't need to learn everything that we teach them. But if they can remember one or two things, that's what's really important for them to take away. So that that's been a really proud moment. But I think also just getting on with the franchise and actually thinking franchising is a viable option and a really good positive option. Like I'm so excited for the future Ed. Like the the feedback I've had from people like that have messaged me and said oh can I find out more information whilst we're still at the very early stages yet it's it's been phenomenal the response like I'm really really excited for our first year of franchising and where that's going to take us so perhaps my proudest moment hasn't happened yet but I'm pretty sure it's it's right around the corner when I see other people taking on the lead to like me um in terms of a main marvelous franchise yeah, I think your um your business has launched at the right time, as you say, after a pandemic and with kids, you know, perhaps not being in that education system as much, and it being quite a stressful situation for parents and children, and and mindfulness is is um getting a lot of airtime at the moment, isn't it? Which is is great yeah. to see. So mm-hmm. I think uh, there's lots of potential for your business, but I wonder where, what's kind of the the the, the longer term goal for you. You know what what. What do you want to see from Mind Marvels in maybe five years' time? Oh, um, it's so exciting. Like, I love talking about it because I'm just like, I've no idea, but in a good way. (laughs) Like, I I envision that we're going to have a solid solid set of franchisees by that point. I'm just spreading, spreading the word. I have plans in the pipeline for merchandise and really just just seeing where this wild and wacky adventure takes us but I'm really excited to be at the helm of it because I'm so looking forward to seeing and um, what what an impact we can make on young people and and that's really what I'm what I'm all about is how can we start these young people with the best tools in life to then bring them with them as they grow up into adulthood and that for me that that's the the biggest the biggest thing about main marvels is um just working towards that goal um, and and supporting even more young people awesome so my my final question then is around uh franchising and if somebody's looking to buy a franchise license and now I know you're pretty early on in your journey but what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's about to buy a, a franchise license from either yourself or anybody else mm-hmm. if it's too good to be true it probably is. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I've done a lot of research on franchise and I've been to franchise shows and I've really, really looked into other franchise franchises. And I have to say, in the children's activity sector, there are so many fantastic franchises. Like, you know, I've met so many good people like Jane James and, and just really lovely people that have supported me. And there's a lovely network out there of people. So, don't feel alone, ask all the questions you need to. But if somebody is forecasting you're going to be making, you know, hundreds of thousands in the first couple of years, I'd take a little step back and think about your own why. But also, you know, just really do your, your due diligence um, when it comes to, to finding the right franchise for you. And it will take time. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today, Karen. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and Mind Marvels a bit better. Um, and thank you for sharing the, the the stories along the way. So uh, yeah, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.